Um, thank you very much. Uh, first to the director, thank you for inviting me um, and the National University of Mexico for hosting this. Um, also, for everyone's uh, infinite patience in my uh, lack of Spanish, uh, everyone has been very friendly and uh, patient with me so far, so thank you. So by the, by the title of uh, my talk, you can tell I'm going to be talking about uh, MOOCs. Um, these have come up a lot the last few days, um, a little bit to my surprise. So you may uh, be tired of hearing of them, uh, or you may want to hear more. Um, in the hopes that you want to hear more, uh, I'll dive in here. So MOOCs, of course, stand for Massive Online Open Courses. And uh, much like a, a, an online course you would take um, and pay hundreds or thousands even uh, of dollars, um, these courses are proctored by um, a faculty member, a professor. Um, they have lectures embed, uh, embedded in the, in the content. Um, and also you receive uh, quizzes when you take these courses. Okay. Okay. Right, okay. So, um, but unlike, unlike the traditional uh, online course, these, these courses uh, can be enrolled uh, by anyone across the world. Um, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of uh, participants uh, take, take these courses, um, and they're free to anyone, provided that you have um, an, an email address and an internet connection. And here are a couple uh, examples of uh, what, the, what the front of a course would look like in this uh, in this platform. Okay, um, so here are the uh, three major uh, MOOC providers. Um, there's edX, Coursera, and Udacity. Um, edX was was um, founded by MIT and Harvard, um, and now it currently uh, offers 72 courses uh, for free to anyone who wishes to enroll. Um, the next Coursera, they own, uh, they, they uh, offer 445 courses, um, including some, some top universities. Uh, the National University of Mexico hosts uh, one of these MOOCs. Um, and then also Udacity, which was uh, created by Stanford professors, uh, and they currently host 28 courses. Um, this, was, this was taken a few months ago, so that the numbers are, are probably uh, up at this point. Right, so there are a number of uh, uh, promises of potential with these courses. Um, one of the ideas is uh, besides offering this uh, free education to thousands and thousands of students, um, that, that they could be used in conjunction uh, with, with classroom time, um, sorry, in conjunction with face-to-face uh, -face class, they would, uh, the students would receive the lectures, um, the lecture content through the MOOC, and then report on, on campus and uh, and have the time for that, uh, the in-class time for a face-to-face -face discussion. Um, another uh, promise is that uh, these classes can be used to identify top prospects to attend uh, universities across the world. Um, students who may not have uh, access to top quality education, they can take these classes um, and receive receive um, recognition that they, uh, they are a potentially good student and then um, you know, liaise with that university. So um, I think there's been uh, a lot of skepticism surrounding MOOCs uh, to date by uh, a, lot, a lot of people in the higher education field. Um, they, they see this as not a good uh, replicator of uh, in-class um, in class course. Um, I think that skepticism is somewhat founded. Um, also, they, they'll make note that um, only five to 10% of the students total who enroll in these courses actually complete the coursework. Um, so there is some prevailing skepticism uh, about these courses. However, um, the last year or so, actually, there have been developments that have defied some of these, some, some of the skepticism. Um, this includes the, the number of courses that now are being offered. Uh, their uh, number of courses of, of student enrollment is up as well in these classes. 
Also, some top universities have begin, uh, begun granting credit for some of these courses. Um, the Warren School of Business now runs a four course uh, platform where you can receive a certificate in business foundations. Um, the Harvard Business School um, is unveiling a similar program uh, this spring. And uh, Georgia Tech University is doing a hybrid uh, module where uh, students can take MOOCs from home and then do a couple of residencies and then they'll receive uh, their masters. Um, so with some of these developments, it seems that MOOCs actually have a little bit of staying power in higher education. Um, and so for that reason, uh, I think actually librarians have, have a role in uh, supporting these courses. Um, be before I dive into that, I actually want to um, identify some of what's going on uh, in these courses. So here are examples of, um, of how these courses integrate uh, scholarly resources, which is, which is not very much. Um, the first two here are taken from a couple courses. The professors request that students download some, some material. This actually, um, I follow this, and it, it linked to some copyrighted uh, material, so that's not something you should be linking to um, in, a public, uh, in a public forum. So, uh, and actually in the third one here, um, they say that there's no resources that are needed uh, to complete this course. Um, everything's, uh, everything is contained within the course. Okay, so um, what's actually going on here is that um, these courses are striving to be equivalent to an in-class traditional college course, uh, but they're not integrating scholarly resources and they're actually bypassing the librarians in uh, their support of providing uh, additional content. So uh, here we go, Some of the, here, if we were to integrate um, librarians into these courses, um, these are some of the challenges that are faced. Um, the, the scholars, the, the, the faculty currently are not using librarians at all. Um, and also there is the issue that um, students who take these courses are unenrolled uh, students, so the librarians might actually run into some trouble with, with copyright if they were to link to proprietary, uh, proprietary sources. So do librarians have any role at all? Um, I argue here that uh, there's an actual natural marriage between open access material in these MOOC courses. Um, every year, uh, more and more open access documents are, are made available. Uh, this actually, this, this graph here, I, I, I created using uh, a lot of science documents. Um, this shows the steady increase of open access documents uh, listed in the web of science. Those are articles, notes, and reviews. Um, currently through two, uh, 2012, there are almost 700,000 open access resources. So why open access resources? Um, Besides uh, the fact that if you were able to integrate these sources into the course, it would improve their overall quality. Um, there was also a, a low cost in providing um, these, uh, these resources. Uh, they don't cost anything to take an article or a review. Um, the only cost would, in, would include uh, the time taken to post these to the, uh, to the platform. And also to mitigate some of the copyright issues that's um, that some courses could get in trouble with if they are proposed uh, post proprietary content to their uh, MOOC platform. So, um, if librarians were to integrate uh, secondary sources, or sorry, open access sources into these courses, uh, what would that entail? They'd have to uh, lobby the faculty to show that there is some value add to adding scholarly resources um, to this platform. Um, it improves the overall quality of the course. Um, additionally, students will learn a little bit about information literacy by linking to these um, scholarly sources. There you go. And here, um, just to give you uh, an idea of uh, some of the journals that are available open access, um, I took these took this uh, metric from the journal uh, citation report. 
and there are currently um, over a thousand open access journals just in the JCR alone. Um, and also a great resource is the um, directory of open access journals uh, that hosts a lot of uh, open access journals where librarians could take resources um, and then integrate them into a, a MOOC. Um, I actually used the uh, directory of open access journals to see if I could do this myself. Um, I just took uh, two courses at random from, from Coursera. Uh, here is in, uh, Introduction to Financial Accounting, and from the Department of, uh, or sorry, the Directory of Open Access Journals, I found these two journals um, and linked to them. I provide a little uh, write-up on them, um, and these would actually qualify for uh, the, you know, they're not copyright material, and um, they increase the value of, of that course by directing students to these resources. Um, the second course here, Computing for Data Analysis. Uh, similarly, I. I Use the Department of, or Directory of Open Access Journals, and uh, was able to find this journal um, that's very relevant to this course. Uh, so MOOCs are, are still in their infancy, and they have a lot of room to grow. Um, I think it's reasonable that librarians uh, can get involved at this point. Um, there's a low risk and a great opportunity to get involved with these courses, um, and by linking and integrating open access resources with these courses. Um, I believe that students will uh, enhance their overall learning experience. Thank you.